Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this webcast. This is uh, an OSLC community webcast, and we are today going to cover the Rational JIRA adapter. For those of you who may be new to uh, OSLC, we'll just take a quick overview. And uh, all this information is available online. As you see, as I give the brief introduction to the talk, I'll just be flipping between some web pages. So you can certainly read up more on this later. Uh, OSLC is an effort to standardize the way that software and lifecycle tools share data. We want to make integrating lifecycle tools a practical reality. This has been a tough problem. Uh, it's something everybody struggles with, integrating their, their various software. And through OSLC, we're trying to make that easier to do. It's inspired by the web. It's free to use and share. And we're hoping to drive change in the industry by doing this. Just before we start the webcast, I want to do a little bit of advertising. Just today, we also started a community survey. And uh, it's an opportunity for you to express your thoughts and and uh, uh, feelings on OSLC, say a little bit about how you're using it. Uh, it's going to help, help us figure out how well we're doing at uh, achieving the goals that we've set forth and also maybe what things we should be focusing on next. It'll take, it, it can be done in less than five minutes. I, uh, I, I did it myself and uh, took some extra questions, some supplementals and everything else, and it was under nine minutes. I even wrote some essay questions. So it really doesn't take a lot of time, but it's very valuable to us. So I hope you'll take the, the survey. If you go to uh, open-services.net, you'll see a little pop-up there, and it'll be asking you to take the survey. Now, as far as the webcast series goes, this is an opportunity for people in the community to share their experiences, to brag about what they've done, and to con connect to other members and start having some discussion. So I hope you're going to enjoy the webcast today, but if you have also done something in the, uh, with OSLC, maybe you would like to present the webcast. And you can certainly uh, contact anyone in this OSLC communications work group to, to, uh, to propose your idea. Today's webcast is about the rational OSLC adapter for Atlassian JIRA. What this allows users to do is to connect um, IBM software and or IBM rational software with Atlassian. So you don't have to throw away your JIRA deployment in order to, to use. Uh, new software that you've seen from Jazz that's interesting to you. You can just continue using what you were using before, and you can augment it with the new features that you see that you want from rational products. This is exactly what OSLC is trying to enable every company to do. Instead of being stuck in a, in a proprietary sandbox where you can only choose amongst the tools that your vendor tells you you can choose, or instead of having to throw away everything that you're used to using in order to get a few new features that you need for one reason or another, you can just augment everything you're doing right now with some other great piece of software and become that much more uh, productive and get that much more business value out of your solutions going forward. So today we have Joseph and Joseph who are um, both with IBM Rational and uh, both participated in the work on this adapter for Atlassian Jira. And now I'm going to take the chance to turn over the webcast to them. Uh, which Joseph should I make the presenter? John, if you give it to me, this is uh, Joseph here. Very good. Thank you. Let me get the sharing started here, and we'll dive right in. Is that uh, coming through for folks? Looks like it may be a, a little bit slow.
I don't see it yet. Okay. Give it another second here. There we go. All right. There Slowly, it is. Clearly. There we go. Um, and to experiencing this, folks, if if uh, I get a little bit ahead of uh, the slides, just yell out, tell me to slow down, and uh, we can make sure the, the sharing catches up with what we're talking about. Um, so with that, Sean, I thank you for, for having both of us here, and um, we're very excited to have all of you on the call to hear about what we've done with OSOC and specifically in building this adapter for Atlassian JIRA. Um, so what we're going to take you through today uh, is to step back for a minute and talk about Rational's overall vision and strategy for how we deal with third-party tools integrating with our own offerings. Um, and then we are going to give you a demo of the adapter in action, show you exactly what it's doing and how it works, uh, what it looks like. And, and then Joe Leong here, my colleague, is going to take you through some of the development, design, and strategic decisions that were made in building the adapter. Uh, we hope to uh, appeal to a broader range uh, of audience here, both uh, those, those trying to address the business challenges of integration and then those who are also looking at the, uh, the technical implementation side of building uh, third-party integrations using OSLC. So over the, oh, I'll give it a sec there for that. Okay, there we go. Um, over the course of the the past few years, whether through various conferences, uh, customer calls, or really any interactions we've had with our with our customers, we've been attempting to gauge how important uh, third-party tool integrations are and how diverse our our client environments truly are. Um, and although not surprising, but still very telling, what we've learned is that. Um, our, our customer environments are very heterogeneous. They're very diverse. Um, and, and here is a chart that um, presents some data on just how diverse and, and, and what we are really looking at here. So I won't go through every small detail of it. I think it's, it's telling itself, but some of the highlights are that uh, almost all of our customers are managing three or more tool vendors within their life cycle. That means they may have rational, they may have a third-party tool, and they may have something homegrown. Um, in the lower left-hand side, all of, almost all of our customers are dealing with open source tooling uh, in some fashion or another within their lifecycle environments. Um, but as the point there says, two-thirds of them say it's not working out as well as they'd like. Um, almost 90% of them have built in-house tools to, to supplement maybe a lack in the market of, of where they've got holes in their lifecycle. Um, and in addition to that, a vast majority of our, of our clients have supplemented vendor-provided integrations with uh, in-house efforts that they've done themselves. So in other words, they've, they've maybe taken on or, or purchased a, a vendor-provided solution for integrating two uh, products, but it didn't do everything that they needed to do, so they've still had to commit additional resources to, to get to the point that they, uh, that they wanted to get to. Um, and so Rational definitely recognizes this and, and recognizes the challenge of our customers and um, through the OSLC mission, through what Sean has described in the community, and through the, the strategies and architecture of how we build our own products. We are uh, really aiming to try to remedy that the best we can. Let's let this next slide paint here. All right, this uh, is a, a, a image or a diagram of kind of how we look at the way we architect our own products um, and how that then intersects with third-party tools that we have identified and have been expressed to us that our customers are, are using at our priority to them. So the, the left portion of that diagram is a, a reflection of our effort that is called JAZZ. Um, and now within that are a number of different aspects, both technical, both community-oriented, um, and both product and life cycle development-oriented. So the, the kind of the foundation of, of this jazz world is the platform itself, and this is what the products, uh, lifecycle products, whether in the quality management space or, or change and configuration management or any of those other domains, this is the platform they sit on. And this platform, leveraging the technology of OSLC, uh, enables then these tools to talk to each other, to, to link data to each other, and to ultimately provide that um, application lifecycle management environment uh, that is is what our customers say they want to deploy within their company. Um, on top of that platform, then, as I've said, are the Rational products themselves. Um, the initial release of this, the, the Rational solution for collaborative lifecycle management, included the tool Rational Team Concert, which is a change configuration management, sor source code management, uh, planning and build, 
Um, it also included Rational Quality Manager, which is a quality tool, and Rational Requirements Composer, which is a requirements tool. Uh, in addition, there was some reporting involved in that as well and dashboarding capabilities. Um, also, also within that, that platform are the application frameworks and toolkits, and these are the assets uh, available to build applications on top of this platform. And then surrounding all of this effort is the community itself. So those of you familiar with Jazz.net know exactly what I'm referring to, but if you're not, I, I do suggest you, you hop out there and take a look at Jazz.net. And um, that is where we trans uh, excuse me, that's where we develop these tools and develop these platforms and share our, our strategies and our plans in an open and transparent environment. So you can go in there and you can review development plans, you can participate in the forums, you can submit defects. You really have a, a real good insight into how Rational is evolving and, and addressing the challenges in our industry. Um, and then if we look to the right side of the diagram, that's where uh, our third-party integrations come into play. So uh, I won't go into it right now. I'll touch on it in a, in a subsequent slide, but Joe and, and myself are part of the Rational Integrations Gearbox team, and our primary focus is on building adapters so that we can integrate third-party tools with our Jazz platform environment. Um, and we go about building these adapters in, in really just two different fashions, but the common denominator is OSLC. The, the technology we adopt to build these, these integrations are OSLC-based. But what we want to highlight in this diagram is that with the project LEO, the OSLC SDK that is out on clips.org right now, uh, that is the, 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 the baseline or the starting point that you can um, begin building your adapters with. Um, and the reason we've then separated out these LEO-based adapters from non-LEO-based is just to highlight the flexibility of OSLC that uh, it is not a requirement that you use LEO. Uh, it, is, it is encouraged and it would probably be to your benefit because there's a lot that it do, does for you that you don't have to do on your own. But what we want to highlight here is that OSLC is an open technology. You can follow the specifications directly and build your adapters um, from scratch, essentially. I'm moving on. Um, give it a second to paint here. And, and you know, as we wait for these screens to paint, if anybody has questions, feel free to chime right in. I've okay, got a so <coughs> taking what I, I have, a question. Uh, just up, oh, go ahead. Is there a question? Yes. Um, so you developed these. I kind of, kind of, I unfortunately had trouble getting in. Um, you may have covered this. So do you develop these for, you know, our customers uh, from scratch? Is that right? Uh, yes. To, yes, really. That's uh, the straightforward answer is yes. But so what? To, to elaborate on that a bit, um, there is the team that Joe and myself are a part of, and yes, we are developing these adapters, and then we're making them available to our customers. And I'll in a later slide I'll show uh, or provide examples of the of various situations we're trying to accommodate in our customer environments and why we are building these adapters. Um, we also have our business partners that are our um, IBM business partners that have gone through a ready, through ready for Rational program, and they we work with them to support them in building adapters as well to, to support integrations. So, yep. If I have a customer, they have some test harness or something. How long would it take to develop this? Uh, what's what's a normal? I mean, I'm a normal I'll stretch, but what's the range of days or? Yeah, I mean, it could really vary quite a bit um, depending on what use cases you're trying to support. Um, and, okay. and we'll go into details of the components that make up an adapter, but it could be anywhere from just building a single provider for a single domain to building a number of providers and consumers across multiple domains. Um, rough so, estimate on the time spent for the adapter we're, we're talking about today, I'd say, Joe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe four-ish months or so and, and two people, two and a half people. Yeah, yeah, four months and two people, is that correct? Yeah, two to two and a half. Not, not all of them were full-time, but added up, and it was about two two people months. Or and there, and there, again, it, months. it really depends on the on the level of integration you want to create. As you know, as, as a very vast and and uh, large-scale integration will take longer. And even if something's simpler than, than the JIR integration, it could take, you know, a little shorter. But about four months is a good average for a good, yeah. a good uh, just, you know, regular integration. And in a, in a few slides here, we'll take you through the demo so you can see just what four <coughs> months actually gets you. So it's not for the faint of heart. That's what I'm hearing. No, it is not, but um, one thing that, that Joe here, who was just talking, will highlight is that we built this adapter before Project LEO was in the state that it is in now, and had it been available at the time when we initiated this project, 
um, that time spent could have would have been reduced quite significantly. So um, he's gonna he's okay, gonna talk okay, about good. a few of the things that we would have been able to leverage from Leo, which at the time we had to kind of build from scratch. All right, thank you. Hey, Joseph, there's also another question in the in the chat. Is it full lifecycle integration with Jira or just RTC Jira task sync? Uh, it Maybe is. You'll cover that later. But. I will cover that later, but for one, it's it's not synchronization. It's it's linking data, and it is not just RTC. It is with RQM and RRC as well. Okay, so um, I won't spend too much time on this slide. I, I feel it's it's fairly self-explanatory, but it's it's. Uh, just to be able to step back and look at the broader vision of, of what Rational has in mind for uh, integrations and OSLC development. Um, the platform itself, where our CLM products currently sit on, uh, over time it will expand to accommodate new Rational products, we'll move our legacy Rational products into this um, sphere as well, and also, um, which we're talking about today, any lifecycle tool as well. Okay, um, quick blurb about the Rational Integrations Gearbox. I'm getting the sense that everybody's anxious to hear about the demo, see the demo and hear about how it was built, so I won't dwell on this either. But uh, as I've mentioned, we are a team dedicated to building these third-party applications. Um, that's They're highlighted in the left column. Uh, down the middle, we also uh, are putting resources into just developing OSLC assets in general, so whether test suites, reference implementations, uh, sample codes, so on and so forth. Um, things that you are seeing crop up in Project Leo and out on the Open Surfaces site where we're one of the teams uh, contributing to that. And then uh, along the right-hand side, integration assets, so um, scenario documents, working with our enablement teams and our Unleash the Lab and our support teams to, to prepare them for dealing with uh, third-party integrations. Okay. Put this paint. Um, and again, I won't go through each one of these, but these are the type of situations we're trying to address uh, through building our integrations. And you'll notice there are some other products highlighted in your uh, Hewlett Packard Quality Center, uh, the Git source control system, uh, and then Jira, of course, are, are our main focus right now. Um, but the type of questions we have or the comments made to us is, yes, yeah, so, you know, RTC is great and all, but we have a, a very large and entrenched investment with, with HPQC. How, if we were to bring RTC into our environment, how are we going to manage the traceability? How do we manage defects when they are submitted in RTC, but we have our testing done in, in HPQC? And this is a, a point where linked data and OSLC technology can come into play. Um, or crossing into another domain, they want to use RRC for requirements, but there needs to be that, that association between their testing efforts and their business analysts and requirement efforts. What can you do for us there? Um, and that same type of thing, which I'll show you in the demo today, uh, we we do our defect management in Jira and our testing in RQM. Uh, can you provide us the ability to integrate? And again, the, the Git one, we uh, manage source control in Git, but we do our project planning in RTC. We need something to connect that data. So these are, this is just a very small sampling, but these are the type of scenarios and situations that come to us from our customers, which we're trying to address both in the strategy I just went through and then with the um, solutions that we're going to show you here in a second. So with that, um, I'll let this paint again. And I do apologize for the slow performance of our web conference. I promise you that Dafter performs much, much quicker. Um, for your reference, this table here just lists every supported use case. So to that question of whether it's just RTC or other domains, um, this is a, a good reference for you to look at. And I believe, Sean, your slides may be posted, or at least the recording, so you can come back and have a closer look at this. But as it shows, we're, we're spanning the domains within the CLM offering. We will make these slides as well as the recording available. Okay, great. Now let me uh, jump over to the demo. I know this is going to be not the best performance. While we're waiting, any any questions up to this point, or everybody just itching to see it work? So I have one question. Again. Sure. Um, so so what's this Project Leo? Um, Project Leo is a it's a software development kit for OSLC development that is available out on Eclipse.org. 
Um, so you can go to forward slash Leo or, or do a quick search, but it it comes with reference implementations on building OSOC adapters. There will be test suites available through it, code samples, uh, some documentation. Um, really, it's just a, an SDK, but focused on, uh, on OSOC-based integrations. Yeah, and that's and L-Y-O, uh, right? L-Y-O. Yeah, L-Y-O. L-Y-O, yep. And, and there will, the next webcast actually will be uh, from one of the committers on that project. It'll, we'll talk about it at the end, but March 20th. We'll have a webcast all about uh, Eclipse Leo okay. milestone one. Sure. So everybody who wants to know more, you can go to uh, eclipse.org slash Leo right now, and you can also just come back. And Was that an IBM or uh, 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 Eclipse uh, uh, project? I mean, who, who developed it? It's, it sorry, it's a, it, an Eclipse project. Okay. And the webcast will be an OSLC community webcast. There are IBM committers involved with it, but there are folks from outside IBM that are also involved in building out the SDK, too. So it's a community effort. Excellent. All right, looks like my screen is caught up. So um, uh, what we're going to show you here is where the, the adapter um, supports integrations between the three products within CLM and JIRA. Um, and so where I am right now, I'm in our rational quality manager tool. And um, I kind of jumped ahead in that life cycle scenario. But we are at a point now where our tester, his name is Tanuj, he has uh, just finished running a test case. And after reviewing the results, realized that it has failed and he needs to submit some defects. So I'm going to scroll down <laughs> very slowly. And there we go. And under the defect section, there's a couple buttons that he can click to either create a new defect or link to existing. I'm going to first create a new one. And what I'm presented with then is it's, uh, it is performing much quicker on my end, just to <laughs> highlight that. Uh, I'm presented with a dialog where I can choose then which CM provider I want to create that defect into. So if, if I wanted to create the defect in RTC, I could do so. That second option in the list is actually our Rational ClearQuest product, and then the third one is JIRA. Um, and just to anticipate the question, these are the names of the projects within those products, um, and I know it's a bit cryptic right now to, to understand which product is for which project, but if you were to configure this yourself, you could name your project whatever you need to to make it more clear, more obvious which tool you're actually filing this defect into. Um, but in this case, I'm going to click JIRA, which is the last one, and I'll hit OK. And I'm going to be presented with a dialog. And this is where then I will fill out the details of the defect. And as you can see, it's grabbed data from the test case itself and pre-populated some of the fields within the, the defect submission form. Um, and one key point I really want to highlight here is that this interface I'm looking at, this form I'm looking at, is not a, a form or interface that resides on the JAS server. This is coming through the, the delegated interface aspect or technology of OSLC. So what that really means is this is the JIRA interface here. Um, so again, we're not synchronizing any of these, these um, dialogues. It's not being rebuilt and then pumping data back over to JIRA. This is the JIRA dialog coming directly from the JIRA server. I'm going to, uh, just for the sake of time, accept the stuff in here, but again, these are all fields from JIRA. If there's any customization happening in the, in, the, in the forms on the JIRA side, those automatically are reflected. There isn't an additional configuration or anything like that required. I'll click Create, and you'll see that's created. Um, I'm not going to link, because I know we're getting a little bit behind schedule. JIRA has a lot of good stuff to cover. Um, but the second button here, I could go then pull up another dialog and query the JIRA repository so that I could then link to other defects that I may know are already submitted against this particular test case. So just to, to summarize briefly, I can create or link to existing. Um, one thing I will highlight, however, is the UI preview. So this tester, and I'll give that a sec to catch up, this, this tester may come back the next day after you submitted that defect and wants to know what's going on. Um, more than likely, he's not going to want to have to go look up the JIRA server URL and try to remember his login and all that stuff. He can invoke this UI preview here within his test case, within his own assets, and, and kind of check the status of things. 
You can see if it's been resolved, it's been, if it's been addressed, if there's been any comments, and that kind of thing. All right, so let me uh, quickly save this. No, so a little bit behind, I'm just, just saving the changes here. And as you see, it's associating the defects. So I'm going to then jump over into that, that issue so you can see what it looks like on the other end. And even though I'm still logged in as the same person, uh, in real life, this would be, you know, Bob the developer or, or somebody else who this defect has just been filed against. Um, and something I want to highlight here is this. You see there down under OSLC links, um, it, what had happened then when I saved that change to the test case is that wrote backlinks or bidirectional links to all the related assets within this lifecycle environment. So the, the plan item that drove the test case, it links this defect back to. Um, the tests, obviously, that were, were created, it links back to. Now, if we go look at it from the plan item side of things, there is the original story. And if I go down in here, um, you'll see the, the defect I've just create, oh, sorry, it's a bit slow there. The defect then I just created is uh, linked to that plan item as, as well. So if you say your development lead is monitoring his stories or his plan items to gauge what are blocked by existing defects um, within that plan item, and so if he can see that, in fact, this one is blocked by defects, uh, submitted by our, our tester, Tanuj, who was running tests in RQM, but the defect is actually submitted in JIRA. So there's, we, we, through this integration, we maintain that lifecycle traceability across the applications, whether rational-based or not. And one thing I will show you, too, is from the RM perspective. So just let me navigate over to that. I have a controller version here. So to complete the, the life cycle story here, then this is the requirement that drove um, the plan item we were just looking at and then subsequently drove the testing and which resulted in a defect. So there's, again, that traceability um, highlighted all the way through. And um, what, I, what I'll also call out is that um, the integration of JIRA to these three products is not just writing these links. If I was that development lead still in that story and I want to create a task spinoff of that to our developers who use JIRA, I can do that within um, that story item. So instead of having to navigate into the JIRA environment, I can create a task in JIRA through the delegate interface, which I showed you over in the RQM site, into the JIRA environment. And I could do the same here from our RRC or our, our requirements tool as well. I'll show that to you here quickly. So if I wanted to say it's uh, the wrong one. So if I wanted to say this requirement is tracked by a particular um, task that is over in JIRA, if I need to create a task, I can do that within here as well. And I won't go through the process of creating. I realize the painting is slow here. Okay. Um, and I really have just given the surface of all the supported use cases. Uh, but are there questions up to this point or, or anything of what I've shown or what I maybe have not shown that folks would like to look at a little bit closer? Did this uh, kind of answer some of those questions that were raised earlier? All right. Um, so then with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe, and he's going to talk to you a bit about how this thing was actually built and some of the decisions that were made along the way. Let me switch back to the slides, Joe. Sure. Thanks, Joseph. Um, as I already mentioned, uh, we're just going to talk about some of the design decisions and um, considerations. But before we dive into um, those details, I want to take a step back and talk from a higher level 
um, kind of the perspectives about why we are, or what we're trying to accomplish in this integration and kind of the role that each tool um, plays. So, you know, starting from the, from the fundamental tools, um, we have the rational uh, solution for collaborative lifecycle management, the, the CL, CLM suite that uh, Joseph just demonstrated. Um, in there, you can kind of see the details of the different domains that each tool plays. And then we have Atlassian JIRA, which is a, an issue tracking system, which is categorized under a change management system. We'll uh, go over to the next slide. Um, so what is the objective of our development? Um, really, we want to create an integration with the CLM products as a whole, the, the CLM product tool suite uh, that integrates with LS and Jira. Um, just kind of enumerating what Joseph has already demonstrated, just being able to create and link to issues in Jira from the, from the various um, products such as RTC, RQM, and, and RRC. So how do we go about this integration? Um, as we've already surfaced several times, we're going to use a specification that describes um, what we're going to try and communicate. So it comes down to the, to the OSLC provider and consumer. That's really the, the basic two roles that um, in, uh, the integration, the, product, the tools that are going to be integrated uh, really, really fall under. Um, these roles, they, they describe how an application interacts with an OSLC specification. So um, the OSLC specification provides basically a, a principle kind of guideline. To, it really describes, um, really describes the data in each different domain. Um, and so as I keep saying the word domain examples, um, there are such as change management, um, requirements, and, and quality management, the, the different aspects you saw um, earlier. And, and what the, the specification does for each of these domains is it, it creates a way to associate with each other through linked data. Again, really just emphasizing we're not, we're not synchronizing the data. There's no uh, buffer in between. There's no rules. It's really kind of, kind of a one-source um, model, a linked data model, that is. Um, so an OSLC provider is responsible for exposing the domain data in accordance with the OSLC specification. And that creates exposure to creating and updating and querying the linked data. Now, on the, the opposite role, the OSLC consumer is responsible for consuming these services that the provider um, services so that it can kind of manifest access to, access to these domains, such as you saw these delegated interfaces that Joseph was demonstrating, the creation dialog and the um, search capability. Um, and uh, also, uh, Underneath the hood, aside from these delegated inter interfaces, there are services that support um, back-end calls. So really, what are the products playing? Uh, what are really are the roles these products are playing? You know, as I said, the provider, in a nutshell here, uh, it really just hosts the CM data, and it surfaces it, surfaces it through the specification. And the consumer, uh, in a nutshell, basically provides a way to access and get at this CM data through the specification. Um, Rational CLM is the OSLC um, CM consumer here. And something to really emphasize, one of the, the, the key benefits here is that um, you already get this for free in all three products by just implementing the spec. Um, the, the Atlassian JIRA is an OSLC CM provider. And um, basically, that's the objective of our uh, implementation here, is that we just have to make that product an OSLC CM provider and um, the rational products which consume this, they'll automatically just kind of fall in place and be able to utilize that. So I'm going to go um, talk a little bit about specification. Uh, I'm sure you know you, you've heard this in several different contexts, but you know it, it really just kind of boils down to it's it's a set of expectations you and I understand. Um, you know, for for example, um, you know we're we're trying to negotiate, and and perhaps you're selling me a car. We're, we're going to be, have to be able to speak the same language. Uh, you know, for example, English, you're going to use car vocabulary, uh, attributes, details about the cars that you really expect me to understand, the, the model of a car, the, uh, um, the color, what kind of trim there is. And, and that really is kind of um, the same idea of, of how we're, we're describing uh, the integration here, is that we, we speak the same language here. Um, so how do we go about creating this rational CLM 
and Atlassian, Atlassian Jira integration. Um, the, integration is, the integration point between the two products is really creating and accessing the change management domain data. And, and this data is... I'm sorry, is there, is there a question? Was there a question on the line? Um, and so some of the, some of the change uh, management data is um, issues, work items, tasks, enhancements, the attributes such as the priorities, the, uh, the timeline. Uh, all those things kind of make up the change man management data um, domain. And so uh, Atlassian Jira here produces the CM data, such as bugs, tasks, and new features. And we're going to leverage um, the OSLC change management spec um, to do this. So basically, it really provides a set of expectations for how to describe this CM data. So um, let's talk about this a little more concretely then, the, the delegated interfaces and, and services. So really, um, after implementing the specification, the provider specification and the consumer specification on, on the respective products, some concrete examples is that, as you'll recall from the demo, they're able to understand that one is going to provide a creation or selection dialog and that the other is able to um, access it and know how to access that. Um, the UI preview, for example, uh, the consumer knows that um, this type of service is um, available to it and the provider um, knows what to produce for it. And um, lastly, some other, some other things is a way to really provide backlinks, as you saw in, in, uh, in JIRA there, there were backlinks back into the CLM products. Um, and so there were, there's, a, there's a service layer underneath and um, a bunch of other good stuff I'll get into next. Um, so I'll just take the points, just re recap real quick. Um, OSLC is really the technology, but it's the basis that enables this integration through the roles of providers and consumers. Um, the objective is to integrate rational CLM with a lot and this is, uh, this is shown in the ability for rational CLM to create and access CM data in Atlassian Jira from, from any of the tools in the suite. Um, and we're going to do this by leveraging the OSLC change management uh, specification to set the expectations for what is uh, communicated uh, between the two products. Um, and before I go into the, the design decisions, are there any questions on kind of the 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 crux of this um, of this technology. Okay, great. So we'll we'll go into the design decisions. Um, I'm not going to cover the the spec in detail itself. Um, you know, uh, you can find the attributes and the shape of this data on the Open Services site that uh, Sean was kind of pointing uh, you you towards. And at, at the end of this, um, there will be there's a Resource, a resource slide that you can get at to kind of uh, do some self-investigation or ex exploration. Um, and this is just a basic outline of a couple of the different topics we're going to talk about. Um, so I think the format I'll, I'll go in is um, we're going to try and cover each of these topics. Um, and then towards the end, if, if you can kind of just kind of uh, file away, at the end we'll have an open session to just kind of go back and revisit different topics rather than um, stopping along the way. I just want to make sure we, we cover on each of the the topics um, for uh, for breath's sake, and and, um, and then we can uh, do follow up. So uh, the first one is really the embodiment of the implementation. The, the very first idea is where where exactly is this integration going to live? Where is this application going to live? Um, a couple of the choices that came to mind is is this going to be an embedded plugin? Is this a plugin that that is installed in Jira similar to what um, what they do in their uh, plugin exchange, uh, kind of an extension of Jira, or are we going to kind of provide a standalone server integration, which is kind of more of a proxy model, just something, some mediator that stands in between the two products, products to uh, kind of uh, do the uh, communication uh, uh, munging between the two. In the embedded plugin, some some benefits here, and, and these are actually really meant to say the benefits. I, it's kind of confusing. I put minus plus, but it's the benefits. Um, in the embedded plugin, we're going to be closer to the Jira data. Um, we can aggregate the data um, and do computations locally. There's going to be less HTTP overhead communicating uh, data back and forth. Um, we really get the ability to extend and manipulate the Jira web interface uh, 
a lot, a lot more. I mean, uh, we're going to be able to work kind of hand in hand with their API to to create a spot for backlinks or, or anything else. Um, there's a much richer API um, in the plugin as you would expect, since it lives so close and actually within Jira. Um, some of the pros of the standalone server is creating a, a more reusable OSLC CM provider architecture for other integrations. As, as you can kind of see, a standalone server would be kind of agnostic to, um, for example, being close to uh, Jerry. It really just is a, a mediator model. So um, there's some benefit in, in going down that approach if you have several different um, products you'd like to uh, invest integration into. Um, with this model, you'd be working with the Jira REST API, which is actually uh, something that's kind of new that they've been um, in newer uh, relatively in, in their APIs. And um, it is a lot less complex. It really, it really starts at just getting at the, the, the issue data um, and not a lot of the other stuff. And um, there's potentially less administration that's needed, uh, li less administration access, which is required in the standalone server model because you don't have to go in and admin the, the Jira server. At the, end, at the end, we conclude, we waited out and concluded that the embedded plugin approach is really um, the, the primary way we're going we're gonna to go about it. And, and that's because we needed access to a, a richer set of APIs and the ability to really just kind of extend their API to, to create the integration we, we wanted. So I'll, I'll, this is just a quick diagram of uh, kind of where it lives. The top is basically Atlassian Jira. And within it, you'll see the uh, OSLC CM 2.0 plugin that lives in all that lives uh, right next to all the other user install plugins. And with the uh, the bidirectional arrow below that, that's kind of communicating through REST to our rational uh, product suite there. The uh, next topic is really how do you surface this OSLC CM provider data? So now we're talking about from Jira. How do we how do we surface that? Um, so OSLC is, is a REST full service. Um, it's, uh, you get at the data, the, the medium that we choose to communicate is through REST calls. So how do we, so how do we handle all, serving all these different web contexts and services? Uh, a, natural, a natural technology and specification that, that um, came to mind was just JAX RS. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the enterprise, uh, Java Enter Enterprise spec, as you know. And, and it's great to delegate serving different contexts and routing these HTTP verb calls that you need to, to kind of uh, be the framework to drive um, communication. Um, Jira actually uses uh, JAX RS to service, is, service its REST API, as I was talking about earlier. Um, in our integration, um, no additional binary footprint was needed to, to enable this for us. We just kind of basically uh, piggybacked what they already provide um, for, for our JAX RS um, service. Next topic is, is data representation. Um, what this really boils down to is, is how, do, how do we uh, show the different uh, specification documents? Some of these examples of these artifacts are a service catalog, which is kind of a, a real high level uh, entry point to seeing uh, what kind of different um, what kind of different uh, uh, integrations can I connect to, and and in the provider it, it goes down to well which project you know which Jira project for example can I can I uh, create a route to, and um, and then just basically down to specifying what is the change request data look like in this specification. Um, so we went about this we created uh, POJOs uh, to represent our uh, change management domain data. Uh, as, as opposed to uh, keeping things at a very low level, such as uh, RDF triples or at the very at, at the lower data model, um, we, we just created a basic set of POJOs to model the CRM resource um, according to the specification, and, and we just extended upon that to kind of capture uh, some extra Jira details that that we may want to use uh, in other places. Uh, a very a very typical pattern, um, and then an operation that's that's kind of high frequency is is converting these POJOs to the various data formats. And what I mean by that is um, the data that we serve out between the, uh, between the consumer provider, they're going to be in, in XML format or they're going to be in JSON formats. Um, so we really wanted to leverage an automated process to do this, and we used uh, Jaxby, another 
um, uh, Java Enterprise Specification uh, just fell naturally for helping to unmarshal and marshal the data um, with the help of annotating um, the POJOs. And then we, uh, we just used uh, the same kind of idea for uh, just uh, instituting a, a JSON marshaling or marshaling uh, method. Um, the next bit is, is security, um, a, kind of a big topic. Who's, who's allowed to access Jira issues? Who's allowed to access these uh, change management resources? Um, we tried to really say, you know, we don't try and guess and interpret, uh, you know, who, who plays what. We, we, we delegate the security to the respective products. And um, some additional support that we needed for that was OAuth to kind of bridge the communication between the two. Uh, CLM users, they must log in to access their uh, CLM resources. Nothing new there. Um, but when attempting to create and link artifacts in Jira, whenever we could delegate the security to uh, Jira to surface the login, the, basically the standard login into a, a Jira to create or, or do other tasks, we, we go ahead and we went ahead and, and reused that. We surfaced dialogues from Jira to, to log in to, to decide what kind of permissions you have. And then um, when CLM goes ahead and, and puts in some of these backlinks um, in, in Jira, we, we use OAuth um, to do that to do that uh, friendship. And then lastly, uh, Jira has a has a permission manager to manage and authenticate um, requests in a session, we, we basically use that to kind of secure our, our services. Um, now, the second, I believe the second to last topic now is the specification validation and the, the compliance level. I'll, uh, I'll wait for the, the, the screen to paint here in a second. But um, just to talk generally about it really is um, how, do you, how do you go about validating your specification? So, you know, we have these, we have these uh, uh, specs and you have to implement them. You want to make sure that, that they're going to work well. You can see how it would be a very iterative process to um, constantly manually test your specification to figure out what's working or not. Um, and this, this kind of falls into the LEO test suite. This is um, provided at the Eclipse LEO project that we were talking about earlier. The LEO test suite, um, which is kind of part of the, uh, an extension to the SDK, is uh, it, accept, it assesses the level of compliance your implementation offers. Say you're, you've, you've kind of got a, you've taken a good stab at, at creating a, a, a valid uh, uh, OSLC provider. You can use this to run a test and uh, to, 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 to generate a report. Um, this can be used in conjunction with build testing. Um, you can, it'll generate a compliance report for you. And uh, again, this is all available on the Eclipse project site. The compliance report levels, um, Really, when you look at the specification and the details, you'll see that there are, there are different levels of integration. And they're, they're denoted by uh, must, should, may, uh, just to kind of tell you, you know, what is really core needed and what is kind of extra. Um, and so, so, for example, rational CLM products tend to implement a more, more parts of the specification. And, and um, you know, uh, reason being, it provides a richer integration then. Um, for example, um, OAuth, uh, different format representations, RDF, XML, and such. And the, the compliance report uh, will help assess this compliance level, and it'll generate graphs for you, a summary uh, count of, of your validation, and kind of a breakdown if you want to drill down to that. And I'll talk about the, the last bit, hopefully, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, really, the SDK that we've kind of talked about earlier, uh, previously, I, I, I'm, I don't recall the name, I don't believe I got the name of who was asking this, kind of asking for the kind of the man hours used to produce it, and I said, um, you know, uh, we said four months for two and a half people, but really that's because we, we that's given that we really only had a, a, a constants file, basically uh, a, a dictionary that, that kind of provided us some, some set um, attributes that we could uh, use in our implementation. That, that was in the beginning, and we've gone, we've gotten so far uh, from that now, and it's, it's evolving more and more. So that's, that's good news to tell you how we can reduce the man hours uh, to invest in this. So, so the Leo SDK now provides um, a lot more facilities to help in implementation. The, a big one is the OAuth provider framework. Um, in itself, OAuth is another specification. And you start thinking about, you know, you may have thought, oh, now I'm going to implement another specification on top of specification. Um, don't worry, we we understand and hear hear this. So the OAuth provider framework is uh, is a part you can use in the SDK um, to generate your your RDF XML, your JSON documents, 
we really tried to create, um, we created, a, there's a method to, to annotate, just annotate uh, your POJOs, annotate your POJOs to kind of describe where they, where they map to this OSLC specification. And we try and do the rest. We try and generate these OSLC documents, the service catalog and bits uh, I was talking about earlier. And, and based on the annotations, we're able to infer uh, through introspection um, what's going to be, what the format's going to be for JSON and RDF XML um, and all those other bits you'd have to create uh, otherwise. Another small utility is there's an RDF storage utility recently implemented. So if you've got configuration metadata, just a, a small little um, generic storage that, to help you along. Uh, you know, the point is um, there's been progress. There's more underway. And um, you can go to the Eclipse Leo project, um, take a look at the roadmap, and, and get an idea of what's going on. And actually, you know, this is the, the whole point of this is to really cater to you, to help enable you to, to create these uh, with as low of a, a barrier as possible. So, you know, the, the survey shops up, and, um, you know, feel free to get involved. Help us understand what you need. What can we do to help, uh, you know, help you decrease your, your time investment here? So, you know, I, we're coming close to uh, the, the end of the call um, at 12 here uh, Eastern. Um, any questions or anything that we can start to talk about um, that, that helps provide clarification on uh, implementing your own adapters or um, anything that I've discussed here? In the meantime here, I do want to highlight some of the, the links that are, are here on the resources page. Um, the adapter itself, it is available out on jazz.net. It is free to download, and there are also trial versions of the CLM offering you could download if you don't already have that uh, in your company. Um, and I believe JIRA offers free trials as well. So if you're brand new to any of it, you can try it all out for free for the time being. Um, that link particularly takes you to an article on it where to download it, how to configure it, install it, use it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then just some other references, uh, the Open Services site, the specification for change management, and then where you can get uh, the LEO SDK directly. And the last one. And I know that some of this, um, you know, we went through uh, various topics in this call. It takes a little bit to, to digest, or maybe it'll only occur when you start to implement. Um, you know, as a, as a follow-up, you know, uh, please feel free to contact our team. The information should be at the, the JIRA webcast page, um, and we could, uh, you know, reach out and uh, we can help um, point you in the right direction if we don't have the answers or, um, you know, get an idea of what, what you'd need us to help with. You can also post any questions about implementation on the OSLC forum. That too, yep. I don't see any questions coming in, but I... I really think that last part, uh, Joseph, was a really great insight into the decision-making process that uh, you went through uh, on your way to producing that, uh, the excellent integration that you've done. I think it's valuable insight to other implementers. And uh, hopefully even just watching this uh, and looking at your slide deck in the future will, will make it easier for other people. In addition to everything going on in LEO, uh, which turns out you kind of were doing some really great promotion for our, our next webcast. So um, we are basically at the end. Just before we, we finish up, uh, of course, just jump in if you do have any other questions. Maybe there's one come up there. Uh, Joseph, would you mind giving me control of the meeting back again? Sure. So another question did come into chat while we were we were discussing, asking if there are any other adapters uh, currently available? Uh, I can tell you that in LEO right now, there is a Bugzilla adapter uh, as a reference and limitation, but at a state that you could you could use. Um, there's also an RT2 Excel adapter also within LEO, and um, uh, our team, Joe and myself, our team itself, are, are currently working on HPQC and also Git. Um, and in fact, to those both, we have a um, design partner program underway right now, and, and a design partner program is where we bring in our customers and we talk through the design process of these um, integrations and demo and give early access to betas and that kind of thing. So if you're a HP user or Git user and, and you also are a rational user and you like to get involved, feel free to reach out to any of us so we can get you into the program. But uh, yep, to answer directly, we've got a couple under, other underway right now.
Right, and actually on the open-services.net website, there is the software page that lists out a number of different adapters, and so you can see beyond the uh, IBM Rational OSLC adapter for Atlassian Jira, there are four others listed on there um, for a couple open source, a couple open source ones, the Fusion, Fusion Forge and the Jenkins plugin, as well as uh, a couple of commercial offerings from Cover and TaskTop. Well, as I was mentioning, there is uh, our next webcast is on Eclipse Leo, and so for uh, the, all the interest we've had on this call, it's probably going to be worth your while to join that. You can find this blog post announcing it uh, on the website. It was just announced today. Again, please, please take uh, five minutes or less and come and do the community survey. We've uh, we've already got in a number of, of responses. The survey is running all through the the month of March, so Take it and share it with uh, with anyone you know who has uh, any interest in in uh, OSLC or just uh, uh, lifecycle tools in general. And uh, all that feedback will be will be well used by us and, and very much appreciated. So I would now like to close this call. Thank you, everyone, for for joining the meeting. And uh, I hope you have an excellent day. I hope this information has been helpful to you, and I look forward to seeing you join us at other webcasts, including the future one on March 20th for Eclipse Leo. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.